Just so you all know, per Dr. Quimby's announcement at the very end of the chapel service, um, we are going to stay on time for this, so this event does not start till 945. So you do have free time? So no, no, can't. Thank you. Thank you.
For those people who are uh, guests, there are a number of seats uh, in the auditorium, so I'm going to invite people before we start so that uh, people who are in the back can get comfortable. Please come forward. There are some empty seats, particularly in the ends of aisles, and uh, help yourself. So we'll take a, a couple of minutes to let people get situated. Welcome to the Historical Symposium. The research paper is a colossus of independent and authentic learning. Uh, it's a big task, and it's daunting, requiring independent study over a long period of time. Here at Gov's, the American History Research Paper looms for many students as a kind of monster, 
for students in our regular survey course, at least 10 pages of thesis-driven exposition derived from critical analysis of multiple texts. For advanced placement students, at least 15 pages derived generally from even more intensive and extensive reading of primary and secondary historical sources. But the historical research paper is really a friendly giant, more like Littlefoot, the Apatosaurus, than T-Rex. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. That's Mr. Long. <laughs> and so that the research paper is going the way of the dinosaur in most schools across the land is more than unfortunate. But here in Byfield, we have a few dinosaurs living still. As the Academy adapts to changing times and in our historical drive to innovate, we know which parts of our heritage, which traditions are mammoths of authentic learning, as vital today as ever. The history research paper is one of those mammoths, and Governor's Academy is among a dwindling, dwindling number of schools that still require all of their students to write them. Mindful of the Academy's approaching 250th anniversary, last year I asked my students in AP US history, all of them members of the 250th class of 2013, to research subjects concerning our school's history. This morning, they and two students in other history sections who also chose to research aspects of the Academy's past are presenting their findings. Each of their studies, to varying degrees, derived from archival research, mostly drawing from primary source historical texts and materials in the Pascasolito Library Archives. And for that, I want to acknowledge the invaluable resourcefulness and help of archivist Sharon Slater, her predecessor, Lori DeMonica, and library director Susan Chase and her staff, without whose guidance these students could not have made what they did of their historical quests. I think you will agree with me that they have tamed the monster. One after the other, they will now introduce themselves to you, each presenting a four-minute precy of his or her research and thesis. Their papers, all of them exemplary works of scholarship, can be read on the Academy's website at www.govs250.org, appropriately located under the tab titled Highlights. And these historians will be available this afternoon over in the Student Center for anyone who would like to, uh, to talk with them about their work. I don't know if the Academy has ever staged the like of what you're about to see on the stage today. And I think you will also agree with me that these young historians are making Academy history. Please turn off your smartphone, sit back, and appreciate what I assure you will be a fascinating hour, as interesting for its representation of the Academy today as for its resurrection of some remarkable relics from the Academy's past. Good morning, my name is Connor O'Day and I'm a member of the class of 2013. And for my thesis, I researched the history of Richard Dummer, the grandfather to the founder of the Academy, Governor William Dummer. My thesis was that Richard Dummer's actions significantly impacted the religious history of the colonies. And without him, America as a nation may not have become the religiously diverse and accepting nation that it is today. I used a lot of different research methods because of the timeline in which the events of surrounding Richard Dummer occurred, I didn't have a lot to go on, so I had to use a few primary sources, such as John Winthrop's journal. I used a few archival documents, newspaper clippings, Nehemiah Cleveland, who was the historian for the school for a number of years, his centennial discourse, and a series of e-books that were only available online and no longer in print. Richard Dummer was born in 1589. He was a native to Southampton, England, and he sailed over to the New England colonies in 1632 on the vessel Whale with his wife, Mary Jane Mason Dummer. 
He arrived in Mass Bay on May 24th, and he was father to Jeremiah Dummer, who went on to become a famous silversmith and work with Paul Revere. Richard Dummer was involved with a secret movement known as the Company of Husbandsmen. He was brought into the group by Stephen Botchler, his stepfather-in-law, and he became their legal advisor. The Company of Husbandsmen was a secret, fervent Calvinist group that went against everything that the Church of England postulated was right. They had to work in secret because the church completely disregarded everything they had to say. When they appointed Richard Dummer as their legal advisor, they wanted him to take control of every single document that went through the company. There were a number of aristocrats involved, and understandably, there were a lot of monetary funds being used for many of their actions. They employed him to found a colony alongside Stephen Botchler, his stepfather-in-law, in the New England colonies later in the same year. The company set aside a patent known as the Plow Patent, which lay in the Casco Bay area of Maine, what we now know to be Maine, of course. And this area was supposed to be a strictly Calvinist colony. It was supposed to embody everything religiously that the Company of Husbandsmen supported. What was interesting was Richard Dummer sailed to America a few months before the colonists were supposed to arrive on the vessel known as the Plow, hence the name Plow Patent. When he arrived there, he realized that the land was unmanageable and was no place for a colony. However, he did have the opportunity to notify the company of this because the captain that sailed him over on the whale was also the captain of the plow. It would have been very easy to get a message out, but for some reason he didn't tell the company about it. It's postulated that Richard Dummer intentionally did this, and evidence to back that up would be that Richard Dummer lost none of his investment in the colony despite its failure, and yet every other member of the company did. Therefore, the company had to be disbanded. A lot of his actions were very secret in these dealings, and after the disbanding of the company of Hudsonsmen, he went to settle in Roxbury later the same year. Stephen Botchler, his stepfather-in-law, no, no longer the religious head of the group, went on to found Hampton and the first church in Hampton. This, of course, does change the religious landscape of the New England colonies as there had been no area there before. It became one of the central hubs of religion. Richard Dummer was also very involved in social and political conflict, and especially religious conflict, in the New England colonies. The antinomian controversy took place a few years after the Company of Husbandsmen was disbanded. Richard Dummer worked very closely with Governor John Winthrop of Mass Bay Colony. He was even appointed treasurer, and this is the reason, among others, that we have the land that is now where the school resides. However, Richard Dummer's wife, Mary, sympathized with the antinomian views of Anne Hutchinson, famous woman who was later exiled to Rhode Island for her views. They went to weekly meetings with her, and later on in life, when John Winthrop found out about these meetings, he disarmed Richard Dummer and told him that he was no longer treasurer and could no longer be involved with any politics. Despite this fact, when John Winthrop fell on hard times because of the failure of one of his retainers to manage his funds and was completely bankrupt, Richard Dummer was the largest contributor of aid to John Winthrop's cause. Because of Dummer's actions, he was able to establish a kind of religious diversity in the colonies. He aided Anne Hutchinson in her establishment of land near Rhode Island that would be, become antinomian in origin. And the Armenialist views of John Winthrop were substantiated due to governor, um, Governor's grandfather's aid. It's very important to realize that Richard Dummer had such a profound impact on the religious diversity of these colonies. The colony that was founded on the plow patent later that year actually was one of the first colonies to have multiple religions within itself. So I believe all of this proves that Richard Dummer, in total, created a religious environment that was safe for many and was one of the first diverse places in the country and it helped the country become what it is today. So my thesis was about the war of many names, 
which took place between 1722 and 1727 between the Native Americans and the colonists. Three of the people the war is named after is Greylock, Father, Father Rail, and Lovewell. Greylock was a Native American chief, and he had led a lot of raids in Massachusetts and the Connecticut Valley. Father Rail was a French missionary who founded Moriqua, which was in Nova Scotia, and Lovewell was responsible for a battle that took place on the 8th or 9th of May in 1725, where the men fought incredibly bravely. But the war is also known, known as Gummer's War, which is named after the founder of school, William Gummer. So, in total, the war has seven names. Gummer's War, Greylock's War, Father Rail's War, Lovewell's War, Three-Year War, the Fourth Indian War, and the Wabanaki New England War. It took place between 1722 and then the last treaty was signed in 1727, but there were treaties signed before that because it was between the British colonists and several different Native American tribes, and each tribe made their own treaty. And then the colonists suspected that the French were involved, but there was no hard proof of that. It took place in the Kinnabon and Aginos Ag Valley. So for my research, the archives weren't very helpful due to the fact that my, the war took place before the founding of the school. But my sources took place from during the war all the way up to 2010. I have a lot of books on the more general topic of the Native American and colonist conflicts. But I did have some primary sources like a soldier's account of the war and Colonel Westbrook's letters. It was incredibly hard to find the Native American perspective. I did find one in John Land Encounter by Colin Howell. So my thesis was the war is named most appropriately for William Dummer. As acting governor of the province of Massachusetts, he directed the war, declared by Governor Steve, and managed peace. So Dummer was the most involved. Greylock was only specific to one area and one tribe of the war. Rail was only responsible in one area and he died in the middle of the war. And Lovell was really only known for one battle. William Dummer was the lieutenant governor and commander in chief, so he dealt with the whole area mul in multiple tribes, and he was responsible for the peace. Dummer's treaty was the first treaty signed, and it was the model for all of the treaties that followed. And he was in charge for the beginning of the peace, which ended up lasting 20 years. So that really just shows how much he did in order to maintain the peace, but it had a firm enough base to last 20 years. And it's also really important to note that out of this came the first Thanksgiving proclamation in America given by a head of state. And it was had a lot to do with things like succeeding the late treaties, restoring the peace to our borders, and he also mentioned the health, harvest, and trade. So I just wanted to show you this, and it just shows that that William Dunner really is the person who the war is most appropriately known for. I'm Brett Bitstrup and I'm also a senior here. So I did my paper about Rufus King, who is a graduate from the early Dummer School, which was named um, in the 1700s. So for my research, I had a few different methods. And so first, I used the archives and some articles, and info was helpful there. And also, there's a collection of online articles and newspaper articles that I found some information. But most of my information was from two biographies by Robert Ernst and Hale Brush. And lastly, I also had a collection of his letters um, edited by his grandson. And it, it was great to have a primary source there. So a brief summary of his early, early life. He was born in Maine in Scarborough, Maine, and then he came to Dummer School, who, um, in the 1770s, under Master Moody. He graduated and went to Harvard, where he graduated from there in 1777. He returned back to Newburyport and studied law under Parsons, who is also an alum of the school. So, after studying law, 
can held numerous roles as a public servant. First, and mo first he was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, and later he was a U.S. Senator in New York. An in very interesting point is that George Washington himself offered him the position of Secretary of State, but he declined this offer due to too much um, work in his state. Next, he was a minister to Great, Great Britain, so he spent some time overseas working with international relations. Towards the end of his career, he was a vice pre presidential candidate in 1804 and 1808, and then he was also a presidential candidate in 1816. Although he was not successful, he was still influential enough to run. So my thesis, through my research, I found that Rufus King is a truly an unsung hero of the, found, the founding period of our country because of his constitution to the constitution itself, the foundation of the government, and his anti-slavery views. So he deserves more recognition as one of the premier founding fathers of our country. So as I said, he contributed to the Constitution, and he actually worked on the Committee on Style, which worked on the drafting and wording of the Constitution, and he was also an influential uh, delegate in Massachusetts, so he worked to convince people that the Constitution should be passed. So he not only contributed to the actual famous Constitution, he also helped get it ratified. So he was one of the most outspoken opponents of slavery at the time, and his work in government, um, he tried to affect his views into law. So the Northwest Territory in 1787, his um, influence helped ban slavery from that territory. And also while working on the Constitutional Convention, he may have contributed to the 20 year limit to the slave trade. So, Eric Steinhardt was quoted saying that his speech um, concerning the Missouri Compromise of 1820 and the expansion of slavery was a turning point in the anti-slavery movement, and King was one of the most renowned speakers of his day, and he used this skill to denounce the expansion of slavery in the Missouri Compromise, and he was quoted saying that the uh, slavery is contrary to the laws of nature and enunciated this in his speech. Another inter interesting point of his speech was that it had wide effects reaching all over the country. So I found a source that said um, in South Carolina, literate slaves had read his speech aloud and this was a possible um, spark for the Visa Rebellion in South Carolina, which was one of the most famous slave uprisings of the time. So why should you know his name? First of all, here at school, he lost, left a strong le legacy. Eames was quoted calling him a dumber man, which I interpreted to be a man who has high principles, uses his education posi positively, and upholds the school motto, non sibi sed alis. But his influence extends much farther than Byfield. He left an incredible mark on this country and deserves to be recognized among the founding fathers. He is truly an unsung hero and an amazing alumnus of this school. He contributed to the foundation of America as we know it and truly worked in the spirit of our school's motto, not for self, but for others. Rufus King's name deserves to be remembered. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Bryce Turner, and for my junior year thesis, I studied America's War with Tripoli. There are two Dummer School alumni who were instrumental in this war. The first is Edward Preble, who served as Commodore of America's fleet in the Mediterranean, and whose flagship, the USS Constitution, still sits in Boston Harbor. The second is Tobias Lear, who was the principal diplomat between Tripoli and the US, and who negotiated the peace treaty that ended the war. During my research, I primarily used books, many of which were written after the 9-11 and America's invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Since my topic covered the lives of alumni after their departure from Byfield, 
The archives held very little information. However, I was able to find an anecdote about Preble during his time here. Preble, who had beaten up a younger student, refused to apologize to Master Moody. Moody, in a fit of rage, swung a fire shovel at his head. Preble did not flinch when the shovel swung inches from his face and cracked the desk at which he sat. In response to this show of courage, Master Moody remarked, Did you see that, boys? The young brigadier didn't even flinch. He'll make a general yet. Preble took this unflinching demeanor, demeanor and focused on America's trouble in the Mediterranean. For centuries, the pirates from the Barbary coast had been running a protection racket on western shipping, one in which America had refused to buy into. In response, the nation state of Tripoli, now in Libya, began to seize all, America's, all American shipping, taking their cargo as loot and men as slaves. So an American fleet of frigates sailed off the war. During the war, the pirates had been able to capture one of American's frigates. But due to Preble's courage and intelligence, the pirates were unable to turn this to their advantage. Preble created a plan, right out of the Odyssey, to sail a ship disguised as a pirate vessel into the harbor under the cover of the night. The ship and the Americans on board were able to draw up a side and burn the frigate before the pirates were able to get a shot off. This success was praised both by Lord Nelson and the Pope for its audacity and success. Shortly after this success, President Jefferson fired Preble which allowed for Lear to negotiate a treaty, ultimately negating the, the gains Preble had made in the war. Therefore, the thesis of my paper states that by firing Preble and authorizing Lear to negotiate with the pirates, Jefferson forfeited all that Preble had achieved and betrayed the war's, the war's just cause. Preble and the war itself has largely, largely been forgotten by the American public. However, this brave Dummer alum is memorialized upon the Tripoli Monument, which stands uh, on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Academy, as well as by the Naval Museum that bears his name, also on the Academy. Preble's spirit lives on in the strictness and discipline of the Naval Academy, a tradition that began with this dumber alum. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nora Hamvet. I'm also a member of the class of 2013. Uh, the topic of my thesis is a man named Ruben Delavon Mussey. Uh, born in Hanover, New Hampshire, Mussey is a graduate of the then Dummer Academy's class of 1854. Throughout his life, he worked in both newspaper and law, which included a remarkably progressive relationship with his wife and fellow lawyer, Ellen Spencer Mussey, leading him to eventually leave her his practice. Although his work in law is notable, Mussey's time spent during the Civil War and the things he accomplished while at war are the reason behind my thesis. This is because Mussey is credited with being the first to suggest the raising of colored troops. In my thesis, I examine Mussey, Mussey's dedication to equality and the reasons behind it. My research of Mussey and his life took place mainly in the archives. I looked through many of the books read during Mussey's time at the Academy, trying to find what may have in influenced his ideals. I was lucky enough to find many books supporting my thesis. Because Mussey is not well noted, there, were not, there was not much readily available information about him. This fact caused me to rely heavily on reports and histories of the Civil War and Mussey's Army of the Cumberland in particular. While doing this research, I began to learn a lot about the fugitive slaves who sought protection with the Union troops as the troops moved throughout the Confederate states. These fugitive slaves were also known as contrabands, and during Mussey's time as commissioner of the 21st Army Corps in the Army of the Cumberland, he acquired contrabands. Their presence was a large factor in Mussey's call to raise colored troops. He believed using the men as soldiers would help the Union gain manpower the Confederate States could not tap, while also providing the black men with compelling claims for freedom due to their brave fighting for the Union Army. Mussey's treatment of his colored troops became an important part in writing my thesis because he was dedicated to creating equality for the troops. He put a lot of effort into training the officers and his actions distinguished him from many others within the Union Army. Shown above is a letter Mussey wrote to W.S. Cheatham, a parade commissioner in Nashville, Tennessee. In this letter, Mussey is invited to march in, par in a parade being planned to celebrate the coming Independence Day. Mussey refuses to attend the parade on the grounds that his colored troops were not invited to march alongside him. This commitment to his troops and their fair treatment is what makes Mussey so incredible. 
One of the most interesting aspects of Mussey's life that I uncovered was his personal relationship with President Andrew Johnston. They met while both were in Tennessee, Johnston as wartime governor and Mussey as commissioner of colored troops, and maintained a personal correspondence. When Johnson became president, Mussey was appointed as Johnson's war secretary. It was a short-lived uh, position, though, because Mussey resigned after just a year. This recognition was due to Johnson's lack of interest in promoting rights for the freedmen who Mussey had worked so hard to create equality for. At the end of Mussey's war career, he withdrew from public eye, choosing to continue to adv advocate for freedom, freedmen's rights in the courtrooms he worked in. This choice is why I refer to him as the Cincinnatus of the Civil War and only adds to the respect I have for him. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Imogene Robinson, also of the class of 2013, and the topic of my thesis was um, co-education during the 1800s, so the 19th century. Um, this topic initially grabbed my interest because um, it's really interesting that I didn't know until now that actually co-education didn't happen in 1972, which is only like 40 years ago as we originally thought. It was actually much, much earlier, so over a century earlier. Um, so, obviously, I didn't really know much about this topic to begin with, so I had a lot of help from Ms. DeMonica, Ms. Slater, and um, John Ray, Bill's Bicentennial, Governor Dummer Academy History. So, um, I'll be talking about two periods of co-education in the 1800s. Um, the first was a 10-year period lasting between 1872 and 1882, um, and that was under Headmaster Ebenezer Parsons. The second was only eight years and lasted from 1896 until 1904, and that was with Pearly Horn. Um, this is the class picture from that period. Um, so kind of jumping into my research, these were some initial questions I had. Um, what prompted the adoption of coeducation in the first place? Why did coeducation fail? And then why did they keep retrying it over and over again? Um, it was very strange for me, because the first time I went in and I talked to Ms. DeMonica about this subject, she actually told me that, interestingly enough, girls did not receive diplomas once they graduated from the academy. So right away you can see that there's definitely bias against girls, and um, they were referred to collectively as the annex during this time. So my thesis kind of evolved into that Regal um, kind of exhibits the traditional view of coeducation during the 1800s. And he said that it was only economic struggles at the time that prompted its adoption. That was it, just money. Um, the school was in dire need of cash, so they accepted girls for temporary reasons. Um, nevertheless, though, what I noticed was that the periods of coeducation corresponded directly with the ten years of headmasters, and that was Parsons and Horn. Um, in between, there was an intermittent headmaster who only was here for two years, but there was also a headmaster named John Perkins. And Perkins actually decided to totally forbid girls because um, he wanted to return to like the school's original grounds, and that was as a boys' boarding school, so girls were totally not allowed. Um, during Parsons' period, um, I noticed some points to support my thesis in that his wife, Sarah Parsons, who's over here on the right, um, was basically accepted as sort of an assistant headmaster. She was headmistress of the annex at the time. Um, this wasn't like an official title, but it was sort of given that she was in charge. Um, on the left are two pictures of Carrie Knight, later Carrie Knight Ambrose, and she was one of the original girl students to come to the academy. Um, in her math class one day, she was trying to reach up and write and solve an equation on the board, but she's a girl, she was too short, and the teacher laughed at her. So all the boys in the class stood up and actually refused to stay in class. They left, um, and they demanded that Parsons tell the teacher to give Carrie Knight an apology, which they did. So I thought that was pretty significant. During Horn's period, um, Horn actually allowed Catherine Crow, who is um, in one of the girls pictured there, um, and her family actually moved, but, um, and her brother became a boarder here, but she couldn't become a boarder because she was a girl, girls weren't allowed to board, 
So she got to stay in Mansion House with um, Curly Horn. Um, and then Horn actually was fired by the board um, of trustees in 1904. So upon leaving, he ended up presiding over both the boys and the girls school of the Hawaiian Kamehameha school system. And I know everyone was watching Lulu and Stitch at lunch yesterday. And um, interestingly, the Hawaiian traditional songs in Lilo and Stitch are actually sung by Kamehameha schools. So we have a tie to Lilo and Stitch in a very bizarre way. Um, also during Horn's time, the Dumber Forum debated about co-education. This was the school's debate team, basically. And um, yeah, so they had mixed teams. Roy Johnson and Catherine Crow argued the affirmative and Mary Burns and Warren Small were their opposition. And they made some very important points, including that um, Governor Dummer founded the school for all of Byfield, not just boys. Um, and the judges ended up ruling in favor of the affirmative. Um, ironically enough, just a couple years later, um, they fired Horn and the school once again returned to just boys. Um, so these are some pictures from the time. They're political cartoons of how women were sort of viewed. You can see women were considered bound by the ties of society, or they were evil, like really Eve figures who couldn't be trusted and couldn't learn um, the things that boys were learning at the time. Um, so what did this all mean in like the grand scheme of things, like why did this small school in Byfield going co co why was this small school in Byfield going coeducational so important in history? Um, it turns out that Dummer Academy was sort of at the forefront of what was a coeducational movement. Um, Radcliffe Car College, which was um, the women's section of Harvard, was actually founded during this time. So the school was moving in a very positive direction. Um, and actually, to close on this note. This is a picture of the 1939 commencement, which was a good 20, 25 years after the school ended its co-education periods. Um, and this is a picture of Carrie Dummer. And she, at the age of like 72, got her diploma at last. Um, and she's just one out of probably 50 or 100 girls who received their diploma. The rest of them did not. They completed the academy's course of education that they weren't given their diploma to acknowledge that. So to kind of close out on a quote from the time period, the women have left, left from their spheres, and damn it, we're not going back. Hello, I'm Andy Worsniak. I'm also a member of the class of 2013. And I did my paper on Frank Crow. Um, you heard Imogene mention Catherine Crow. Um, Frank Crow was her brother. Um, and his brother also attended the academy. And he graduated in 1901 and followed his brother to the University of Maine, where he measured, majored in civil engineering. And afterwards, he went to work for the Bureau of Reclamation and a few private construction firms. And he headed construction on many significant dams, most notably the Hoover Dam. So for my paper, I used a variety of sources. Um, the, most, the most helpful sources were um, an anthology of workers' accounts on the dam, and also I had a direct correspondence with Crow's biographer, um, Dr. Al Raka, um, via email. Um, so the bulk of my paper was basically there were some charges against him that he was uh, like a merciless slave driver of his workers and that he pu pushed them through unethical and dangerous situations in order to get the job done on time because one of the thing one of the most remarkable parts of his leadership was that the dam was um, actually completed ahead of time and under budget during the Great Depression and um, evidence of this these charges was there was a worker strike um, and this quote right here um, from the wife of one of the workers who had just been um, diagnosed with pneumonia from work in the, the river diversion tunnels which violated Nevada state law and um, had some toxic fumes and she said and that diehard Frank Crow in the courthouse swore that to the best of his knowledge 
there never had been men gassed underground working. But my thesis um, argued the opposite, that contrary to the opinions of a few disgruntled workers, Crow was not a tyrant. He demanded a lot from his workers, but not without regard for their needs, and he demanded even more of himself. His efficient and fair management of workers was the main reason he finished construction early and under budget. Um, as evidence for this, uh, many of the workers actually spoke very highly of um, Crow, and a direct quote from his biographer um, supported my thesis. I, I actually presented him with the question, like, this is what I'm arguing in my paper, what do you think about it? And he agreed with me, and he said, critics like to find fault with Crow's apparent disregard for the safety of his men, but nothing could have been further from the truth. Um, so as a legacy, um, at the University of Maine, there is a Francis Crow Society for the um, school. School of Engineering, and also in Boulder City, Nevada, where the Hoover Dam was built. Um, there's a monument for him, but his greatest monument is what he left behind, the great dams that would not have been built in such an extraordinary fashion without him. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tom Canada. I'm a member of the class of, two, uh, of 2013. And my thesis was on Headmaster Ted Eames and his contribution to the Academy during World War II. And my thesis states that throughout World War II, Eames equipped his students for later life, trained them to help in the war effort, and maintained contact with alumni in the armed forces, inspiring them and bolstering their morale. Uh, most of my research was done in the archives. I read through all the old archons from 1940 to 1945, and I read Eames' letters during that time as well. I also relied heavily on Headmaster Regal's 1963 history of the Academy. A few quick facts about Eames. He was born on August 14, 1900. He was elected headmaster at the age of 29 years old. And one of the first uh, things he did as headmaster was to change the name from Dummer Academy to Governor Dummer Academy. Uh, during the war, all but two of the firemen in Byfield left to go join the war effort, and so Eames uh, volunteered a lot of the older students at the academy to take their place as volunteer firemen. Uh, he even bought a fire uh, old hand pumper engine called the Red Wing and lent it to the students for their use in fighting fires. Uh, Eames was such a visionary that a full year after he had done this, Raymond J. Kenney, the commissioner at the Massachusetts Department of Conservation, sent him a letter asking him to volunteer some of his older students, which he had already done. Similarly, manpower was depleted all across America during the war. And so Eames gave, and uh, the maintenance and janitorial staffs at Governors were really depleted during this time. So instead of hiring new men to fill these positions, Eames gave their jobs to students. He thought that this would prepare them for later life and help the war effort. He also encouraged them to take summer jobs that would help the war effort uh, in positions such as plane spotters and helping farmers. Eames kept up a personal correspondence with many of the alumni fighting overseas. Uh, he also sent out a monthly letter to all alumni uh, in which he kept them informed of life at the academy and, 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 he, helped, and he thought that this would keep them grounded. Uh, he also sent alumni the addresses of their friends and kept them informed of their movements so that they could keep in touch with each other. Uh, at the dedication for the Alumni Memorial Gymnasium, uh, it was attended by Admiral Bull Halsey, who was in charge of the fleets in the South Pacific during World War II. Uh, he's the second from the right, and Eames is the second from the left in this photo. And I would just like to close with a quote uh, from one of Eames' letters to the entire uh, to all of the alumni fighting overseas. This was written a day or two after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And it reads, How else can we reassure ourselves on this fateful morning when smoke still towers 20,000 feet over Hiroshima that the mightiest force in the universe is still the power of human love? Thank you.
Hey everyone, uh, I'm Joey Rokas, member of the class of 2013. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about my thesis, which was about the old guard of Governor Dummer Academy. Throughout the history of the Academy, dedicated and caring members of faculty devoted years of their lives to the tutelage of students. One such group of faculty members stands out, both in the time they spent at the Academy and to their contributions to it. This group was called the Old Guard. Uh, their names are Edgar Dunning, Thomas Mercer, A. McDonald Murphy, Howard Buster Navins, Art Sager, Ben Stone, Roy Arn, and William Beale Jacob. As you can see, the class of 1953 dedicated the milestone of that year to the members of the Old Guard. Like my peers, I used the Academy archives to find many of my sources. Most of these came in the form of dedications or articles devoted to members of the Old Guard. I also used the wonderful Governor Dummer Academy History by John W. Regal, and I had the pleasure of interviewing current faculty member Richard Levitt and faculty emeritus Michael Moonbees. Before Headmaster Eames came to GDA, the Academy was financially insecure and needed physical improvements and expansion on campus. Eames and the Old Guard brought an incredible fundraising skill and raised and allocated money that went towards countless campus improvements. These are some examples. One that is used daily is the Alumni Memorial, Gym Memorial Gymnasium, which was built under and with the help of the Old Guard. My thesis was as follows. The Old Guard contributed almost two, two centuries of service to the Academy and live on in rooms and fields dedicated to them, but live on even more vividly in many of the traditions and the dignity and honor that we enjoy at the Academy today. These men were great coaches and even started several athletic programs at the Academy, like lacrosse, for example. Several fields on campus bear their names today. Here we see Navins Field, named after legendary coach Buster Navins, and the Sager Bowl, named after Coach Sager. The Murphy Mercer Poetry and Short Story Contest is named in honor of Tom Mercer and Mac Murphy, two highly esteemed members of the English department. Murphy also has a room named after him in Frost, as does Roy Orne. Not pictured, but equally important, is the Stone Room in the Parsons Building, the Dunning Room also in the Parsons Building, and the Wheel William Beale Jacob Dining Hall. I concluded that their true legacy was that the members of the Old Guard left many physical improvements on campus, but my research overwhelmingly pointed to something else as their greatest legacy, their role as models for younger faculty, students, and visitors to campus. As we see, we have quotes from Mr. Levitt and Mr. Moonvies. Uh, I would say that overall, from my point of view, coming in as a young faculty member and seeing the dedication that these gentlemen and their families had shown in school, the respect that the students had for them and the role models that they were for younger faculty and students, I mean, it was unbelievable. Mr. Moonvies. They were premier role models, and not just in the prim and proper way of things, or on the way to teach, but in good character and how to have fun with life. They were terrific. These sel their selflessness, decorum, respect, and diligence are the ideals that we at Governors strive for today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jacob Cromack, and I'm part of the class of 2013. And my thesis paper is about modern language instruction at the Governor's Academy and how it evolved over the 250 years of existence of the school. Um, when the Academy was founded in 1763, the, cur the main part of the curriculum was the study of Latin and, Latin and Greek. And Master, Master Moody himself was a master of Latin and Greek, and these were the two ma major subjects he taught. That said, he did have some eccentricities. For instance, uh, he had a... <laughs> He had, a pa he had a passion for French, and even though that was not an important language back then, he did teach it as an, as an extra activity at the academy. It, wa it, wasn't, a, it wasn't crucially important, but, mm, but it did exist as, uh, as the academy's earliest sources show. Thesis. My thesis is that responding to changing, to, to changing curriculum in American colleges such as Harvard, the academy ended its major focus on classical languages and shifted also to modern ones. And, and this occurred primarily because of the uh, co college admission requirements being ch changed from seven o over 250 years. I used, I used many different sources when researching my thesis paper, for, but the, the main part was the, were the school catalogs, which were issued a annually were from, two, from, from the 1830s, although there were years when they were not issued. 
as well as, well as some other sources such as uh, Governor Dummer Academy History by John Rago or books scores selling language instruction in general. But the, but the main fo focus was still the school catalogs because they usually list all subjects which are taught at the academy in, in, in every given year. Mm, prior to a the 1870s, French and German were only occasionally offered as foreign languages, and even then only for students who did not want to go to college. So, mm, and beginning in the 1890s, uh, the school uh, started offering three different tracks, which was the classical track, which emphasized Latin and Greek, the scientific track, and the English track for non-college-bound students. E even though the, the tracks differed in the amount of, mm, of languages and other like subjects studied, but all of them included at least some form of modern language studies. So th this shows how, mm, how much um, the curriculum had changed in a relatively short time. Mm. Why, why did this all happen? Well, Charles William Eliot became president of Harvard in 1869, and he became and he reformed the, cu the curric curriculum in, in substantial ways. And the governor, the gov and Dummer Academy was a feeder school for Harvard and, and similar similar Ivy League colleges, so it had to respond to the uh, to the requirements uh, uh, to the requirements of, of such institutions. For instance, sometime in the in the 1870s. Uh, the Greek entrance requirement for Harvard was eliminated, and just and just a few years later, Greek was no longer a mandatory language for for everyone at the academy, unlike Latin, which uh, which was still required well well until the 20th century. And students were also a lot more freedom freedom of choice in their courses, and the teaching of modern languages was also emphasized, which was primarily French and German. And surprise, surprise, uh, the academy also uh, the. the uh, also focused on teaching students French and German and not, and not, not any other language back then. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, during the go Governor's Academy two periods of co-education in the late 19th century, the girls did not go to college. They did some girls, but college is not where they were headed. So, uh, so they didn't have to take the same college pre preparatory curriculum as the boys had, um, but w which gave them more, fr more freedom of choice in their courses. And they could also Mm, and also towards them were there directed subjects such as French and German, which were not required uh, for, for admission to college, but, but, but which could like, be pr prove useful for them later in life or, or just for fun or for or whatever reason that they wanted to study them. So, so that, that's why it's very clear that when, when the modern languages are more often offered in 1872 to 1882 and 1896 to 1904, it's, it's because of the girls who, in, who aren't going to, weren't even thinking of going to college. The modern language, uh, Latin, Latin has been taught as a, as a language for 250 years in this academy. So, mm, even though, interestingly enough, in the, in the early 1970s, they did start phasing Latin out, but they, uh, they, never, they never phased it, uh, phased it out before they, before they uh, phased it back in. Uh, French was the most popular language in the 19th century uh, when it was first introduced in, in the academy. German was interesting enough. It was very popular during, during during World War II because people wanted to know the language of the enemy they were fighting. Uh, that said, after World War II ended, no one cared about German because <laughs> <laughs> because it was a language it, it, it was a language where uh, which first uh, of the Nazis and second they were still defeated, so no one really no one cared about that anymore. <laughs> Spanish uh, Spanish is pretty popular today. And, and it was added to the curriculum in, in around the 1920s, or a few, decade, a few decades after French and German. And Chinese was added, uh, added to the curriculum only f uh, six years ago because, uh, as a result of chi China's growing, like, uh, growing economic strength and the, the desire of many students to learn the language, as well as, uh, uh, as a general desire to, la uh, to teach languages which are not only spoken in Europe, but also somewhere else. Mm. And, just as the times changed, so has the academy, and, and this, this has been true for the for the whole 250, year, 250 years of existence of this school. When Harvard changed its admission requirements, the Dumber Academy responded very quickly by, by changing the courses uh, the courses offered, and, and as these patterns continued from the World War II and German until and until Chinese six years ago, the school was merely responding to changes which had which have been uh, taking place in in colleges and in the world, and not just 
no, no, it's not setting its own standards. My name is Jean Bauer, and I wrote my thesis paper on the Academy's change to co-education in the 1970s, focusing specifically on changes in curriculum that occurred after the integration of girls. So to give you all a little background, the 1970s were a very difficult time for boarding schools all across the country, and Byfield was no exception. And a possible solution to these financial difficulties was co-education, the bringing in of girls. Even though co-education was seen as a solution, it wasn't accepted right off the bat. There was actually a lot of fierce debate on the Board of Trustees over this issue, and I think this quote by Carl Piscosolito Jr., who was the secretary of the board at the time, really sums it up nicely. Uh, despite the debate over the issue, the Board of Trustees did vote on January 23, 1971. They voted unanimously to have girls attend GOVs. Um, they were only going to allow girls to be day students. They never wanted to have them be boarders, and they never intended to have a 50-50 ratio of boys to girls. This was seen only as a temporary measure to um, fix some financial tr uh, troubles. And um, actually, when they made the decision in, in uh, January of 1971, they wanted the girls that September, which was only eight months away. So I think they were a little confident. These are some quotes by the then Director of Admission, John Witherspoon, and these are some of the most jaw-dropping things I read. Uh, like, just because they wear a skirt doesn't mean they are going to be accepted. Um, one of my favorites. So, <laughs> um, these at the time, of course, were not, this was an interview in the governor, and clearly this was, kind of shows the cavalier attitude that they had going into co-education, but we have to take it with a grain of salt because uh, Witherspoon actually did a lot to advocate for co-education here at the academy, so yes, they are pretty crazy, but. <laughs> so um, my thesis was that the transition ended up being more uneasy than they had anticipated, with the most notable shortcomings being in the classroom. My sources, there isn't much uh, written about this, so I did all primary research in the archives and this later was incredibly helpful. Uh, I used course catalogs, um, board of trustees minutes, uh, faculty interviews, and alumni interviews. So the girls did come, surprisingly, <laughs> in 1971. There were 25 of them and they made up 8% of the student body. Uh, five years after the start of co-education, Headmaster Jack Ragel commissioned the Ad Hoc Committee to evaluate programs and conditions for girls at the Academy. Uh, uh, they met from October 9, 1976 to December 15, 1976. They focused on four main areas dealing with co-education, facilities, college counseling, female role models, and the curriculum. In terms of role models, in that first year of co-education in 1971, there were only four female teachers. And uh, so the school relied heavily on faculty wives to be role models for these girls. In terms of the classroom, they asked each department to submit a report going over how they were dealing with co-education. Interestingly, the mathematics and science departments did not submit reports, which kind of adds to the stigma of the day that it was a male-dominated field. Um, in contrast, the English department the history department and the foreign language department all submitted reports. Uh, these reports went over things like uh, sexual bias in textbooks, teaching perspectives, things like that. Uh, one of the things I like to point out is the history department was an all-male department and it was the most lengthy of all the reports and they expressed an interest to hire a female teacher which never happened in the 10 years following co-education. So. So the outcomes of the ad hoc committee are absolutely quantifiable. If you look at the number of female teachers, it steadily grows after the committee ended. Um, in 1981, the 10th anniversary of co-education, there were a record 12 female faculty members on the staff. And in 1977, there were two female trustees, BBS Minor and Shirley French, which are really great things for the school. So the legacy of co-education, as Imogene so wonderfully told us, twice before the academy turned to co-education as a solution to financial difficulties. Uh, in the 1970s, that was the same exact thing. They turned to it only to um, fix how the school was in debt. Um, however, in the 1970s, the girls became such an ingrained part of the community here that the trustees 
couldn't possibly go back and the girls were able to come as boarders and the ratio became closer and closer to 50 50 and here we are today so i think all those girls and those teachers and everyone who worked to make co-education succeed here is really what's led us to be the wonderful school we are today thank you very much all right last one um Oh, that's fast. Cool. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Miles Badger, and I did my thesis paper on Headmaster Peter Bragdon's administration during the 1980s. However, I'd like to start my, pre my presentation with an anecdote from the 90s. It was September 1996, and students flocked into the Thompson Building as the, for the first morning meeting of the new school year. As they took their seats, a projector flared to life at the back of the room, casting the image of a steaming locomotive onto the screen at the front of the auditorium. And Headmaster Peter Bragdon emerged on stage, dressed as a railroad engineer, shouting, Get on the big red locomotive. The locomotive, as Bragton explained, was Governor Dummer, and according to him, the students at the academy could either be up at the front of the train, helping it to go faster, or could get off. The act would go down as one of Bragdon's most famous, and it was this stunt, among others, that led me to make the initial comparison between Bragdon, the leader of our school during the 1980s, and Ronald Reagan, the leader of our nation during the 1980s. Both men entered their offices in the same turbulent time. Both men strongly believed in the causes they worked towards, Bragdon with independent schooling and Reagan with capitalism, and most importantly, both men proved to be natural leaders, and just as Reagan pulled America out of the stagnancy of the late 70s, so too did Bragdon save the academy. During his headmastership in the, mix, in the midst of the Reagan Revolution, a sweeping conservative revival of American patriotism and individual freedom, Peter Bragdon employed old-fashioned prep school ethics of teamwork and school spirit to revive an academy that had become atomized, fractious, and dispirited under the influence of a rampant countercultural movement professing communal ideals. That's my thesis there, but before we go into it, I'll take a minute to explain my sources. Like everyone else, I found the majority of my research materials in the Pescocelito archives, many articles from the governor for student perspective, articles from the Archon and Headmasters reports from the era for faculty and headmasters perspective. And in addition to all this, I made use of several histories and journals from the late 70s and early 80s for some sociopolitical context for the paper. And I was also lucky enough to interview both Headmaster Bragdon and Mr. Levitt about the era. Okay, back to the thesis. For context, the two decades prior to Bragdon's arrival, as Jean said, at the Academy were rather bad ones for it, both, or for both America and the Academy. 20 years of socio-political turmoil gave rise to sort of a fierce, defiant, countercultural spirit across the nation, one which you, uh, young people everywhere were quick to embrace. This new anti-tradition, anti-authority spirit was pretty antithetical to everything Governor Dummer was at the time. And by the end of the 70s, while it didn't destroy the Academy, it had brought it into a dangerous stagnancy. Student drug use was rampant, school spirit was non-existent, most boarders now outnumbered by day students had left, uh, left on weekends, and disciplinary infractions were constant. The counterculture had left the academy completely devoid of any sense of community, and the stage was set for either the academy's collapse or its salvation. Enter Bragdon in 83. As soon as he came into office, Headmaster Bragdon set to work restoring the academy to its former glory. However, the academy had become a somewhat more lenient, liberal institution in the 70s, and so when Bragdon arrived, he knew that his first step had to be making the academy into a prep school again. He brought back school, school spirit by fostering student leadership and inciting students to take action in the goings-on of their school, raised the school standards in both admission and rules, and restored student and faculty loyalty to, yeah, loyalty to him through the use of evaluation and accountability a merit-based pay scale for the students, and a demand for responsibility from the teachers. On top of this, he returned the academy to being a seven-day boarding school where boarders stayed on campus during weekends by shifting the balance in student population towards a border majority and increasing the number of weekend activities, notably by opening the mansion house to students on Saturday evenings. This, in addition to a series of canvassing initiatives, elevated GDA back to being a nationally regarded boarding school rather than the small regional institution it had become during the 60s and 70s. By the time Reagan's term as president in 1989, Bragdon had can't read my own notes here, sorry, made the academy completely back into a prep school again. And by the time Bragdon himself left the academy in 1998, he had not only revived the academy, but elevated it to a new level of greatness. So what can we thank him for? Of course, there are morning meetings in Mansion House, but during my interview with him, Bragdon stated that he considers his greatest success during his time as headmaster to have been the implementation of the Square One program, the predecessor of our school's current schedule, and ironically quite a departure from Bragdon's revival of traditions and traditional educational practices. Overall, though, to be blunt, we can thank him for saving the school and for making it the place we know it as today.
I know that all the students will agree with me that you are a spectacular audience. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, they will be available to anyone who would like to speak with them uh, this afternoon in the Student Center classrooms. You can also read those papers online. Um, please give them, though, one more hand, if you would. So now we will have about a 20-minute break, uh, during which you may uh, swing through the dining hall and grab a snack. But please, uh, you will want to reassemble again at one of the four different locations for the panel discussions. Uh, those will start promptly at 11.15, so please, if you could be there at 11.10 and take your seats so that those, uh, the moderators, moderators may begin those panels promptly at 11.15, that'd be most appreciated. One last little housekeeping detail and then I will excuse you. Uh, at the conclusion of the panel discussions, which will be uh, at noontime, you should all make your way to the Pascasolito Field House. And um, there's a catering company there that has set up a, a gala luncheon for us. Uh, apart from a few reserved tables, you may sit wherever you'd like, but you should quickly take seats, and then the catering company will direct us as to where we can get uh, our food in the different buffet lines. So uh, immediately at the conclusion of the panel discussions, if you would head down to the field house. Seniors and faculty. Terrific. Terrific. Fantastic. Awesome.